Hey guys, welcome back to Introduction to Kotlin. My name is Tensor. Today we're going to be talking about object-oriented programming in Kotlin. Specifically, we're going to be learning about classes, constructors, and properties. In Kotlin, a class is a block of code that groups together functions and data that perform similar tasks. We can define a simple class with nothing inside of its body just by writing class and then the class name, in this case, Bob. And then if I want to instantiate the class inside of, say, my main function, I can assign it to a variable and just call Bob like this. If any of you guys have worked with Java, you'll know that a lot of times when you're instantiating objects or classes, you write the new keyword. With Kotlin, there is no such keyword, so it's a lot less verbose. In Kotlin, there's no concept of a field like you might find in Java. Instead, we have what are called properties. So we have two properties inside of our class article. One's called title, the other one's called length. And then we have this constructor function, and this constructor allows us to assign these properties to the actual instance of the article. We call this dot title and then we set it equal to title and then we have this dot length and we set it equal to length then you can see here that we can instantiate our article by calling vol article and then we call our constructor which is just article with a capital a and we put in the title and the length if i want to change one of these properties for the instantiated article i can simply call the property using the dot syntax and then use an equal sign like this another interesting thing about these types of classes is that unlike with java we don't have to define getters and setters for our properties. They're automatically generated for us. This means that we can easily access our properties without having to build in a bunch of boilerplate. This constructor function is what's called the secondary constructor. And this is the more traditional way to write a constructor inside of an object-oriented language. Now, with just a little bit of editing, you can see that we actually have a class that's equivalent to what we had before. This is what's called the primary constructor. And you can use the primary constructor constructor to basically create all of the boilerplate that we had before. Inside of the primary constructor, I set up the properties, so variable title, which is a string, and then variable length, which is an integer. Like with functions, we can set up default values for the properties inside of our classes. With this article here, I've set up a default value for our title called default title. I can just reinstantiate our article, and it will automatically use the default value for our default title. Now, all of the same same rules for default values that applied to our default functions also apply to our constructors as well. With Kotlin, we can also define custom setters and getters. So for instance, this particular class article now uses a custom setter for length. We have to define length inside of the body of the class, and then we create a function called set, and we pass length through it, and then we want to add the logic for the actual setter. This special variable here called field is an alias for the backing field of the property. A backing field is just a field that's used by the properties when you want to modify or use the field data. We can also use another special variable called value, and this value represents the actual value that was assigned to the property by the user. So we're validating if the value is equal to zero, and if it is, then we just throw out an illegal argument exception that says the length must not be empty. Also, we defined our length to be zero to begin with. That way, if a user doesn't add a length to the article, it will automatically throw this error. And then at the bottom, we assign our value to our field argument, which will allow it to be then placed inside of our our length property. We can also define a custom getter and this uses the get keyword and in this case we're passing nothing to it and then we're just returning our field dot increment so the only reason why i'm incrementing the field is just so that we have something specific about this getter if i was to remove the increment you'll see here that it says that this is redundant because it's already generated by the class so maybe for whatever reason you want the article to be incremented by one in this case that's exactly what we're doing and we can get our article length just like we set the article length where we just say val length equals article dot length and then we can print it out if we want to so this should print out to be 51 because we set the length equal to 50 and that's exactly what happens so it's important to note that each time we set the value of our length property the set method block is executed and the same goes for our get method each time we retrieve it as alluded to before kotlin uses what's called a secondary constructor as well as a primary constructor the primary constructor is the one that is at the top where our class 
class is defined, and then our secondary constructor can be defined by calling the constructor keyword and adding another function. In this case, we have our secondary constructor taking in the name, the length, and the published, and then it's outputting this as in an article with a name and a length. And then we also inside of it have this.published equal to published. So the main difference between the primary constructor and the secondary constructor is that with the secondary constructor, we cannot actually declare properties. If we want to declare properties that we then pass into the secondary constructor, we have to put them inside of the class body. If we want to access the second constructor, obviously it's going to be a little bit different from the first constructor. We have two instantiations of the article class. The first one is article where we're just passing in a title and a length number. And then for article two, we're passing in a title, a length, and a Boolean. This is now using the second constructor. The main use of a secondary constructor is to allow us to create properties inside of our class body in such a way where we can then change the values of these properties via the constructor, whereas the original constructor will just leave them alone. And we can even create infinite constructors inside of our classes. So now we have an author property property, which is a string, and we're creating another constructor that will allow us to pass in a name, a length, a published, and an author. And then this will return a name, a length, and a published. And we can call this constructor just as we called the second constructor and the primary constructor by filling out the fields inside of it. If we instantiate a third article, we can then say article with a name of third title, a length of 100, published true, and then an author name of John Doe. And we can then get and set the author name as well and all the other fields too. By default, our constructors also use a visibility modifier of public. They are public to the rest of our code. If we want, we can explicitly make a constructor private. And you can see when I do that, this third instantiation of our article becomes invalid. We can't actually access this third constructor now. Now, because Kotlin uses objects for almost everything, there is a type hierarchy inside of it. The topmost type in Kotlin is what's called the any type. And this type is sort of equivalent to the object type in Java. Basically all this means is that any class in Kotlin will explicitly inherit from the any type. And this includes string, int, double, and so on and so forth. The any type contains three methods. We have equals, to string, and hash code. This means that any class that we create will automatically have those three methods attached to them. So here we've created a class called A with three functions inside of it. We have a function A, B, and C, and then we instantiate A, and you can see that A automatically has a two-string method on it, an equals method on it, and a hash code method on it. And this is because A automatically inherits the any type. Now let's talk about visibility modifiers a little bit more in depth. Visibility modifiers allow us to restrict the accessibility of our API. We can provide different visibility modifiers to our classes, to the interfaces, objects, methods, methods or properties, and Kotlin provides us with four different visibility modifiers. The first one is public, and this is the one that's applied to any class, function, or property by default, and we don't actually have to use the public keyword for it to work. Next, we have the private access modifier, and this means that the function itself can only be accessed from within the same file that it was declared in. The protected modifier can only be applied to properties or functions that are inside of a class object or interface. So this can't be applied to a top level function like our top level function here. And this makes it so that our properties or functions are only accessible within the class itself and any subclass of that class. The final modifier is called internal, and internal basically limits the scope of our class function or whatever that we're applying this internal modifier to, to the module itself. All right, so now let's talk about objects in Kotlin. Objects in Kotlin are a bit more similar to JavaScript objects than they are to Java objects. An object in Kotlin is not actually an instance of a specific class. Objects are very similar to classes, and they have various characteristics. For instance, they can have properties, methods, as well as an init block, and these properties or methods can have visibility modifiers. They can't, however, have constructors, and they can extend other classes or implement an interface. To create an object, we use the object keyword, like we did with a class, and we place this before the name of the object that we want to create. Objects in Kotlin act like singletons. When we create an object in Kotlin, it only has one instance. A singleton is sort of like a pattern in software design that guarantees a class only has one instance, 
and a global point of access to it is provided by that class. Anytime multiple classes or clients request that class, they get the same instance of the class. And we can access objects from anywhere inside of our program as long as they have the correct visibility modifier. So by default, I can just call a.function and this will automatically run this specific function on this object. We can also use objects to define constants. So for instance, say we wanted to define a bunch of URLs inside of our application, we could create an object called constants and then create some properties inside of this object that are val type. And this way they get exposed to our entire program and we know that we're calling those particular instance of those constants without them actually changing. So Kotlin doesn't support static classes, methods, or properties like you would find in Java. However, instead we have what are called companion objects. A companion object is basically an object that belongs to a class, and this class of course is called the companion class of that object. This also means, however, that the characteristics of objects also apply to companion objects, so they are singleton in general. So here's a pretty basic example of a companion object. We've created a class called person with a private constructor. We can't actually access the class itself and instantiate it directly. However, inside of our companion object block, we have a function called create that creates a person object and returns it. And you can see here that we can actually call our person dot create function and then instantiate a person this way rather than using the constructor. Now I know this is a bit of a contrived example. Now an interesting thing about companion objects in Kotlin is that they're lazy. This means that it will be instantiated only when it's needed for the first time. So the instantiation of a companion object happens when an instance of the companion class is created where the companion object members are accessed. When we called person dot create we instantiated this companion object. So again now we have a bit more of a contrived example. These init blocks are interesting because they get called immediately when the class, for instance, gets instantiated. So this init block will automatically get run when we instantiate this person class. And then this init block will automatically get run when this companion object gets instantiated. Naturally, our companion object can also have properties. And the companion class has unrestricted access to all the properties and functions that get declared inside of the companion object. Whereas a companion object can't access the class members. We have our first person that gets instantiated as John Doe. And then we have person two, which gets instantiated instantiated as Jackie Rossi, and then we have a println statement which calls person.count, so we can see what the actual count is. And so this init block gets run every single time the person gets instantiated. The init block inside of the companion object will only get run when the companion object gets instantiated. The output here says created object, so that's the first thing we see. So this init block gets run once, but we have this count of two because we've instantiated our class twice. So this shows us that the object itself only gets instantiated when the class gets instantiated the first time, which also means that all of the information inside of the object is, of course, just a single instance, even though we have multiple person instances. Of course, we can also name our companion object, so I'm just calling this person factory. And now we want to update our code so that we're actually calling the person factory create function. Now we're calling person Person .person factory create, and this allows us to grab the create function from inside of our companion object. This style is a bit too verbose, so typically with Kotlin you don't really name the companion object. So here's an example of a extension function that we can use to extend our companion object person factory. So we just say function person .person factory, and then we call the function name, which in this case is extension function. And then we put the logic that we want inside of this function. In this case, I just want to be able to instantiate a person by calling the create function. And then I just want to print out that person's name. So this will just create John Doe and then print out John Doe. And of course, that's exactly what happens if we run this code. In our main function, we can call this by calling person, person factory, and then extension function. Now, of course, we can call this extension as though it's a member function of the actual companion object, but it's not actually a member function of the companion object. All right, guys, so that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the box below. And if you disliked it, then by all means, downvote it as much as you like. Have a good day.